Would you all stand? Everyone on the floor, go ahead and get to your feet. Everyone up in the bleachers, go ahead and stand to your feet this morning. We're going to start off uh, this morning of praise and worship with a prayer of thanksgiving. So if you'll look to the screen and uh, pray with me. And uh, I'll just go ahead and read this over us and we'll read, uh, we'll read one of the later slides over together. So it, sa it says, accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends, and for the loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us at tasks which demand our best efforts, and for leading us to accomplishments which, satis which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. And above all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying through which we, he overcame death, and for his rising to life again in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. And then we'll read this last slide together. Grant us the gift of your spirit that we may know Christ and make him known. And through him, and there's no screen on the lyrics. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> I'll just read this over us. Grant us the gift of your spirit that we may know Christ and make him known. And through, all, through him at all times and in all places, may give thanks to you in all things. And everybody said, amen. We agree, amen? amen. All right, let's worship today. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Happy Friday. I know you're getting excited for, uh, for your break that's coming up here real soon. And, uh, and it's great to see you all here in chapel this morning. And I know a whole bunch of you just got seated, but I'm going to ask some of you to stand up right now because we want to recognize all those who are going down to Mexico over this break to serve in various capacities. So our Mexico outreach folks, would you please stand up right now? Um, we want to recognize you. A bunch of them are sitting right here in this section. There might be a few of you in different sections, and I know there's still others who aren't here this morning. Please stay standing just for, just for a few moments uh, because we want to do something this morning. We want to, as a community, uh, commission you all. We want to pray for you. We want to pray for the work that God has already prepared beforehand, uh, the things uh, that he's uh, already begun to line up for you and for those who you will serve. We're believing that God's going to do amazing things this year. It's not going to be another Thanksgiving trip. It's going to be a unique time of God's provision, God's blessing, uh, God's revelation over your lives, and also the ways in which you could see how your willing hands can make a difference in the lives of others. So we're going to say a, a prayer over each of you right now. So uh, APU, if you would, please join me in stretching and extending your hands in the direction of, of, the, of a bunch of our folks who are going down to Mexico, uh, even representing some of their friends who aren't here this morning but who will be going as we bless them and commission them. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. Uh, we are thankful just as our worship team led us into thinking and contemplating all the things that you've done for us. And I thank you that this group of individuals uh, have a heart of gratitude that is such that's caused them to want to go and give back, caused them to want to be a blessing to others. So, Lord, we pray for protection over their travels. We pray, Father, that you would guide over every vehicle, that you would allow the process of going across the border and getting back to be smooth, uh, that no obstacle would become uh, something that gets in the way of the work you want to do. So, Lord, would you just provide safety and protection, safe travels. I also pray, Lord, for rich conversation and times of connection, even on the drive down and in uh, different places where they'll be staying together. Would there be encouragement? Would there be moments of clarity, reflection, where they could experience your presence in beautiful ways? And Lord, we pray that their sacrifice and service uh, would make a tremendous impact in Mexico. We pray for every community, every little boy, every little girl, every woman, every man, every, uh, go every governor governing agency, every school, every church, every prison, every community, every park. For Father, we pray that you would just have your way, uh, that our students would go knowing that you are there. Before they get there, you'll be there after they leave, uh, but that their presence would be a tremendous witness of your love. Uh, so we thank you for, for them, and we ask your blessing. We commission them in the name of Jesus. Everybody says, amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much. Go have a good time. 
And we can't wait to hear stories of what God does. So this morning, I, want, I would like to ask you to help uh, welcome our Executive Vice President, Dr. Dave Bixby. Thank you, man. Love you. Hey, good morning. Uh, so, um, uh, Mexicali, uh, have a great time. Uh, I've been at APU for 26 years and uh, at working here, and I've been to Mexicali many times. So I know this because of my years at APU. I think we've had well over 300,000 people that we have sent to Mexicali through the years. It started with about 30 in the early 60s. 300,000 people, high school students, youth groups from across the, literally across the country, and APU students, so have a great time. So like I said, I've been at APU working here 26 years. I love this place. I bleed cougar blood, I do. I graduated in 1978, and I met my wife here in a Life and Teachings of Jesus class, 7.30 class, coffee, Renee, and the pretty good teacher kept me awake. Uh, my wife's here right now, would you welcome her? So uh, there's a lot I love about APU. You know, I love the fact that four of my kids win here. Three have graduated. Uh, Sam is a sophomore here and uh, loving his journey. Uh, I love APU. What I really love about APU is the community that I experience here. So there's, uh, there's a lot of things I'm involved in, uh, work-related, but I'll tell you the thing that I love more than anything else is being involved in community with seven guys that meet in my office on Monday mornings. We do life together, and I'll talk about them a little bit later, but we do life together in transparency. I get to teach a senior sem class. I teach in the spring. I'm not teaching this spring, but I've taught the last uh, 12 or 13 years. And with 25 people, we do community together and life together. And I love being a part of that. And then every year for the last 30 years, I've been a walkabout guide. And I get to do life together in the wilderness for 10 days with generally about 10 students. This year was my privilege to go with the Golden Eagles. Uh, they. Oh, what a shock they're here. Um, anyway, it's, uh, it was so much fun to be with them, but we get to do life around uh, the campfire. So today, obviously, what I want to talk to you about is community. And I've chosen a story in Luke, and uh, I think it will be meaningful to you as you see how a community of uh, people came alongside a woman who is in great loss. So let me ask God to bless this time, and uh, we'll move through this. Uh, Father, thank you so much for what you've given me to share. Uh, I pray that I would remove myself and allow the Holy Spirit to speak uh, through me. Uh, thank you so much for this group of uh, young people. I pray you bless them and keep them over this next week they have off. Please give them safe travels uh, wherever they go and back home again. So we ask you to bless this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so a quick review of Luke. My story, what I'm going to share with you, is in Luke chapter 7. But if we do a quick review of Luke, Luke was a physician. He was really interested in detail. And so the account, this gospel account of Jesus' life, uh, I believe uh, tells us a lot of great stories. So we start with Luke 1 and 2, and that was the story of the forecoming of Jesus, of John the Baptist. Uh, Luke 1 and 2, then Luke 2 is this amazing story of the Nativity, which we're going to celebrate soon. And we all know that one for Christmas. Uh, Luke 3 and 4 were Jesus' temptation in the desert. Jesus is baptized. In Luke 4, he begins his ministry. Luke's, Luke 5 and 6, it's the story of Jesus impacting the lives of men and women that he meets. So in those three chapters and headed into seven, Jesus is meeting multitudes of people and he's healing and he's speaking about a new way of living. In some ways, people have called it the upside down gospel because Jesus talks about a way of doing things differently. And that's what he's been teaching and multitudes are following him. So then we come to Luke chapter seven and what I'd like to do is read that to you. Uh, Jesus raises a widow's son, and that's the subtopic of this. Soon after, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain, and a crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. And when the Lord, when the Lord saw her, his heart was overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin, touched it, and bears touched the bears, and the bears stopped. Young man, he said, I'll tell you, get up. And then the dead boy sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Great fear swept over the crowd, and they praised God, saying, a mighty prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people today. And the news about Jesus spread through Judea and the surrounding countryside. 
Well, before we get in and unpack that, I'd like to talk about what happened in the first part of Luke. So Jesus is in, in Capernaum, and he's done a lot of miracles, and he's becoming known, and a Roman centurion hears of this. Now, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure you know about Rome, and in around 30 AD was one of the most violent uh, countries really in the world. Roman centurions were mean and dangerous soldiers. This one was not. This one had heard about Jesus. He's really conflicted because his servant, who he loves, is uh, sick, and the Bible says unto death. And so the centurion asked the Jewish leaders of the day if they will go find Jesus and just get him to pray or heal his servant. And so the Jewish leaders connect with Jesus. Jesus is on his way to the Roman soldier's house, and the Roman soldier finds this out, and he sends a group to meet with Jesus and says, You're not even wor- I'm not even worthy for you to come to my house. Just say the word, and my servant will be heard. And Jesus said, I've not seen greater faith in all of Israel than this man, a non-Jew, a Roman centurion. And the Bible says, As the people went back to the Roman centurion's house, the servant was wholly healed. And so Jesus now has developed this huge following. So Jesus and this crowd begin to travel to a little village called Nain. And I think there's a map up here. You can see where Nain is. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere in Israel. And Jesus and this great crowd are headed there. Now what Jesus doesn't know is that there's an event going on in the city of Nain. And they're not celebrating, they're actually mourning. There's an older woman there who probably is woken up in the morning to cymbals and flutes. And it's, it's, it's not a good day for her. When she wakes up, it's a reminder of what this day will hold for her. So this day, she is burying her only son. Now it's the second funeral that this woman has had to have from her immediate family. She's a widow. And this is a devastating loss. So it's a community event. Everybody, uh, as she gets up and she prepares for this terrible day, the community surrounds her. In fact, the Bible says a large crowd gathered with her to begin this day of mourning. And so for her, it means uh, loss. It means loss of protection. It means loss maybe of food, of shelter, in addition to the overwhelming sadness. Because in those days, there was no such thing as Social Security the community would come around those who had great loss and they would take care of them. Nain was not a wealthy community. So this woman with the loss of her son is probably on her own. And so this large crowd following this woman in this funeral procession, they're heading out of the city. Just about the time Jesus and his large crowd is heading into the city. And these two groups, the widow and Jesus and the multitudes cross paths. And in a minute, Jesus catches the magnitude of what's going on. He knows that she's lost her only son, and he knows what that means for her. And the Bible says he saw her. So you look at this, and there's no request for Jesus to act. Nobody comes up and says, could you bring to life my son? There is no conversation. I believe because Jesus is always looking for broken people. He's looking for people whose hearts are disturbed and broken. He's looking for people that don't even know him. And nobody is more broken than this woman on this day. And what he's about to do, only Jesus can do. Confucius can't do it. Muhammad can't do it. Buddha can't do it. And in a very awkward moment, Jesus walks up to the procession and those carrying the coffin. And people wonder who this stranger is. I mean, it doesn't say anything about name, knowing who Jesus is. Maybe some had heard we don't know. But in this awkward moment, he stops the procession, and he does what he does, what really he's not supposed to do. He puts his hand on the coffin. He actually touches death. It's really unusual for him to do this, because in those days, if you touch death, if you touch the coffin, you were unclean for seven days, and in front of a crowd, Jesus touches the coffin. See, because Jesus was never concerned about the legalism of that day. I mean, he healed on the Sabbath. He did a lot. He he ate on the Sabbath. They gathered corn on the Sabbath. He is not about to let any legalistic rule or law put in place stop him from ministering and changing this woman's life. And so in front of the crowd, in front of a a grieving mother, He lays his hand on the coffin. He says seven words. This is what he says. 
Young man, I say to you, arise. And there's a picture on the screen, a 17th century painting by Minetti, and it just gives you a depiction of what that may have looked like. And the Bible says, and I, I love this, so this is the greatest tragedy of this woman's life, and Jesus steps in the middle and makes a difference and changes her life and, cre and creates a defining moment for her and the crowds from that day forward. And the Bible says the dead man got up and started to speak. And it also says that Jesus, I don't know if he reached into the coffin and pulled him out, but he said that the Bible says that Jesus gave him to her mother. So can you imagine that scene? At first people are stunned. The Bible says they're afraid. And then they begin to glorify God. And so in that moment, they've seen a young man come back to life. I can't imagine what started out as being the worst day of this woman's life has become the best day of her life, and her community surrounds her. So you've got the people from Nain who may not know who Jesus was. You've got the crowd that's following Jesus, and I believe it became one big party. And those people that saw that, their lives were never the same again. So word, the Bible says word spread through Judea and all around the country, and the word of Jesus became known in part because he raised a young man from the dead. Jesus only did that three times we know of in the Bible. Jairus' daughter, Lazarus, and the widow of Nain. So she's surrounded by her people. They're celebrating, they're loving. Heaven and earth move, and her boy is brought back to life. So Jesus' compassion and his love for humankind turns one of the saddest days into the most joyful day. Her community surrounded her, they mourned with her, they comforted her, and now they celebrated with her. A real and rich community. So, you know, I think about my life and when I've been surrounded by community. I don't know about you. I'm sure there's been moments in your life when you've kind of been what you thought maybe was to your end, and then a friend or a group came alongside you. I know we've all had challenges. When I was 10 years old, I was living in Mar Vista Gardens Housing Project in Los Angeles. Maybe some of you have been by there. Uh, by the way, I really appreciated and loved my experience there. When my dad was 10, he had been sick for a while, but he suddenly passed away. We had a group of people that surrounded us and loved us, so my mom was alone with four of us kids. And I remember many times there was a knock on the door, and I'd open the back door, we'd open the back door, and there'd be just a ton of groceries sitting in our backyard, and we picked them up. And, and so I never went hungry. We had interesting things to eat. But in those moments, even as a 10-year-old, I experienced community and joy. I remember Christmas, we had one of those aluminum trees. Now, you probably don't even know, but your parents may know about this. They had this light that turned from yellow to blue to red, and it'd make a really cool glow on the aluminum tree. Well, during this Chris Christmas season, there was nothing under the tree. There was that knock at the door. We opened the door, and for kids that were 10 and 12 and 8 and 14, that meant the world. There was Christmas presents everywhere. So I have been a part of a community where I felt loved and embraced. So I talked about my D group. We get together every Monday morning and we do life together. It's transparent, it's authentic, sometimes it's raw. But it's life and it's meaningful and it's community. So I, had a, I have had an amazing 30 years uh, being on walkabout. This last year was no exception. For, so for the Golden Eagles, we would hike all day and we'd do community on the trail and then we'd sit around the campfire at night and each person got to tell their story. They got to tell their story of brokenness in their life, of the joys, of the sorrows, and we come alongside, surround them, lay hands on them and pray for them. That is the kind of community I want to be about. That's the kind of community that I would like you to be about. So um, I have one more story to tell you and it was, uh, I was about your age. So I was a told you I was a grad of APU. I think this was in 1977. I graduated in 1978. And uh, some of my friends, and I think they're listening, so I'm going to give them a shout out. Doug and Mayor and Tammy and Sharon and Greg and Gary. Uh, we, were, we were pals. We were buddies. We hung out together. And Mayor and Tammy and Sharon went to Doug. We were living in, uh, uh, well, the living area doesn't exist anymore, but it's where Trinity is. Where Trinity Lawn is and the actual building, there was a place there called Village. And it was, uh, it was duplexes. And Mayor and Sharon and Tammy came to Doug and said, we need more. We want to experience a deeper community. Would you start some type of gathering? 
And he said, uh, I just talked this week to get my story straight. He said, I'm not doing it unless Bixby does it with me. And so Doug and I and uh, the women I just mentioned formed this group and we met on Monday nights. And, um, and it started with about five people in the room. And we had a little bit of worship and then Doug or I or somebody would bring a devotion. And the next week we met, there was about 10 and the next week we met, there was about 20 and 30 and 40. And although we're older and our memories aren't as good as they used to be, I think there were somewhere between 100 and 150 people that would cram into this really small space and do life together. And I remember uh, one night in particular when we had grown to this pretty large group, uh, a really tall, skinny guy walks in. And he's really not clothed very well. He's kind of dirty. And it, he looks like, as my recollection, that he's probably not had a shower or bath. His name was Paul. And somebody had met him earlier in the day and had invited him to come to what we called Monday nights. Paul was not a believer. In fact, he had hopped a freight train and from New York to he ended up in Azusa. He'd never heard of APU. He'd never heard of this university. I don't think he'd ever heard of Azusa. But somehow he ended up, and God's uh, divine intervention in his life ended up at APU. And uh, somebody had met him and invited him to come to Monday nights. And so he came, and I want to tell you that the, the hundred or so, the students that were your age, gathered around him and loved on him week after week. My recollection is they didn't have a place to live. And so some of the members of the group found him a place and helped him with clothing and food and just loved on him. And somewhere in that journey, Paul became a follower of Jesus. In fact, it's funny to call him Paul because he was from New York and every other word he would say was, the word is super, but he would say supa. So he, his name changed from Paul into supa. And so he became a part of our community, not a student at APU. I remember sometime around November of 77, uh, we all thought it'd be a really good idea to go to Ventura. And so somehow somebody, yeah, Ventura, cool. So uh, somebody, we somehow connected with a beach house. Anybody that would let, you know, 60 college students go to their beach house for the weekend is out of their mind, but that's what we did. Uh, and to be transparent, yes, it was men and women. And I don't think the administrators knew about that. Now, if you try to do that, we'll find out. <laughs> but we all gathered in Ventura. And uh, it was one of those remarkable times of prayer and Bible study, and we had a lot of fun. And I remember in the middle of this weekend, uh, on a Saturday morning, Supa started talking about what it meant to be baptized. And so Doug and I talked about it, and a few other people uh, were baptized as well. We went out in the Pacific Ocean, and you might see a picture of the screen. You may not recognize the guy on the left because there's a lot of hair but that actually is me and Doug. And I hadn't seen that picture in years and years. So that is us baptizing Supa in the Pacific Ocean, November of 1977. So let me tell you about Paul. So Paul decided AP was a cool place and so he enrolled to go to school. He got his degree in Bible. He thought that was really a good thing to do and he decided he was gonna go into ministry. Then he got his degree and he got his master's degree in theology. And then he fell in love with the church. And I think part of it was because the community that surrounded him loved him. And he got his degree in theology, and then he became a youth pastor, and eventually became a senior pastor. So I tell you that story because that was all about community surrounding him. So I want to just pick out a few verses in Acts, and then I'm going to have Mackenzie close our time in prayer. My hope for you, my prayer for you is that you find a community to live in because that's how Jesus wants us to live. He doesn't want us to do this alone. Life is too hard. So let me pull out just a couple verses. So Acts, which is our theme verse, Acts chapter 2, 44, all the believers met together in one place. They shared everything. What they had, they sold, and they gave their possessions to those who had need. They worshiped together at the temple. They shared meals with great joy. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship. Why? Because they lived in community. You know, when, uh, when Jesus first started his ministry, there were 12, and then several hundred by the time you get to Acts. And then the church grew and multiplied at the end of the second chapter of Acts. And then the church grew in the next three centuries, 300 AD, there were 16 million I'm sorry, six million Christians. Why? Because people lived in community. Well, see, God uh, 
God asks us to be involved in community and fellowship with each other. He loves us. He knows our name. He knows how important community is. And I don't think anybody is a better example of how community is surrounded than Mackenzie Hahn. And, uh, you know, those of you who know her, she's been on a health journey, and she's recovered, and she's doing amazing. But community surrounded her like nobody I've ever seen. So I've asked Mackenzie to close our time in chapel and song. I'm so blessed that she's here. Will you get up, give it up for Mackenzie? Yeah. So what's the takeaway? The the takeaway is this. Jesus uh, wants us to be involved in community, a community embraced and loved the widow of Nain, a community embraced a 10-year-old kid who lost his dad, a a community embraced Mackenzie, who was in a tough spot, and they came alongside her. So my, uh, my takeaway for you is this. Find a community, get involved, the local church, a D group, see COBA, see a campus pastor, see me, uh, get involved in community. So God bless you, have a great week, enjoy yourself, and take care of yourself.